Hello and welcome back to Retro 48K. It's time to discuss the Dreamcast. That little white box is perhaps Sega's most loved console, or at least its cult status in the community would have you believe it is. For me it would always be the Mega Drive. But anyway, a lot of that is down to some excellent ports of classic arcade titles and the fact that it was cut off seemingly in its prime after just a couple of years of production due to Sega's financial troubles. But you're not here for a history lesson, are you? No, these are the technically correct videos and you're here to understand how the Dreamcast worked. And to be honest, after researching this, I think you're in for a bit of a treat. Sega's last console in many ways sums up Sega themselves way ahead of its time in so many ways, but typically doing things very differently from everyone else. But as per usual, I'm getting ahead of myself here, so let's start at the beginning and the system's basic components. So at its core, the Dreamcast has a Hitachi SH4 Superscalar RISC CPU, which basically it's um, a RISC-based CPU, similar to the PlayStation model, that incorporated a lot of cool Sega stuff like Superscalar and things like that. And it was clocked at 200 megahertz, which was a powerful CPU for the time. I mean, I don't think PCs were any more powerful than 200 megahertz at this time. So. It was a fairly impressive beast, and it would be responsible for processing the game logic, the AI, the 3D calculations, and issuing 3D instructions, but more on that later. It could talk up to 16 megabytes of system memory over a massive 64-bit bus, which was capable of a theoretic, theoretical, if I can say that right, max transfer speed of 800 megabytes per second, which is massively impressive. I mean, if you think about that, that's an entire CD's worth of data in less than a second that, that bus could transfer, and it needed to, for, I'll come onto that in a minute. Uh, and this bus would actually talk also to the real heart of the Dreamcast, and that's Holly. Now, Holly is the GPU and interface at the center of things. It had a power VR2 based core, which meant it worked very differently from other hardware at the time and today, to be honest. It used deferred rendering technology, which I'll come back to later to explain what that is. But for now, you just need to understand Holly worked a bit differently to other machines. It also, Holly also talked to um, the Yamaha ACIA audio chip and it had a 4 times 16 bit buses to 8 megabytes of dedicated texture memory and the Dreamcast was a texture beast it could cope with without the developers having to do much um, you know massive compression of textures and uncompression on the fly it was brilliant at that and finally it, uh, this central holly talked to a 12 speed GDR ROM or GD ROM um, which was Sega's slightly odd CD at the time with slightly bigger storage and it would also talk to the peripheral ports so the joypads and things like that now this is all getting very complicated isn't it i mean just look at the diagram on screen at the minute there's stuff everywhere and i haven't included everything here i haven't even included the flash memory or the os rom that um, stored that windows ce more on that later as well but let's just say for now this is how it worked the data was pulled from the gd rom into holly into the CPU and RAM to be worked on. The resultant calculations would then be sent back into Holly, which would draw the graphics, and then they would be sent to the digital video encoder and onto your TV. That, in a nutshell, is how it worked. But as ever, there's a hell of a lot more to it than that, so it's time to talk about deferred rendering. So what is deferred rendering? Well, one of the most common methods for generating computer graphics is what's called IMR or immediate mode rendering which basically means as soon as a polygon is ready just start drawing it and then you just start drawing the next one and the next one and the next one and it's the most simple way of drawing things on a computer but it obviously has some drawbacks and that is one of the main ones is that it's very wasteful because what happens if the next polygon is actually sat in front of that one and partially covers it well you've just wasted effort drawing something that the user will never see and it also takes multiple passes over the image to sort some of this stuff out which means a lot of bandwidth to the graphics card what deferred rendering does is it waits until it knows more information about the scene as a whole and then starts drawing things it's actually something that came into most game engines in around about 2009 where the graphics pipeline as it's called which is the 
you know, the, the pipe that you push all your graphics through to draw them, would defer certain things to certain points, things like lighting calculations and things like that, until it knew more about the scene. So it's, again, Sega being well ahead of the time by jumping on this. So what does it have to do with Dreamcast? Well, like I mentioned earlier, the Dreamcast has a PowerVR core, and PowerVR was a graphics software and hardware manufacturer actually back in the 90s. And they, back then, we were still experimenting with the best way to draw 3D worlds. So ATI and NVIDIA were doing their thing. PowerVR focused on deferred rendering at the hardware level. Specifically, PowerVR used what's called tile-based deferred rendering, which basically meant, and this is what the Dreamcast did, uh, instead of drawing each polygon as it came in, it divided the scene up into tiles and it would pull a list of all the information for a particular tile into the CP into the GPU, start to draw that image based on the knowledge of that entire tile rather than just an individual polygon. And the benefit of this is because it's working with the knowledge of more than one thing, it doesn't waste time drawing what's not there. It won't draw stuff behind what the other thing is and, and stuff like that. Um, the downside is obviously, this because this is a much smarter way to render the, the screen, it's much more complicated so you, but because all this was done at the hardware it took some of that complication away from developers and also a lot of information between tiles is similar so you can speed up a lot of memory access because if it's already working with textures in one tile that are in the next it doesn't have to pull them out it can just use the same one so it was very efficient that way and the Dreamcast made great use of this. In fact, Sega boast in their development documentation that because this is so efficient and it works on one tile, you can get rid of what you've just done apart from the stuff that's in the next tile and, and move on, that you didn't need a frame buffer and you, you could do it in one pass. Now, this wasn't always the case. If you had some complicated techniques like bump mapping and things like that, which is where you you dent a texture using lighting to make it look more detailed than it is, then you would have to do multi-pass rendering. But for the most part, yeah, you could just do this in one run. Like I said as well, PowerVR was much more efficient, uh, but it was also much more complicated. Its downfalls really were things like lighting and things like that made it difficult to work out because you do one tile at a time. Um, but they did get around this. Dreamcast has some great lighting effects and it was way ahead of its time. Most modern game engines now used deferred rendering like i said so power vr was doing in hardware what we now pretty much do in software but 15 years earlier uh, the graphics cards are just that beefy now it doesn't really make a difference what you do now i've vastly simplified a lot of this even though it sounds complicated i've actually really simplified it but hopefully you get the idea uh, a more simple way uh, to think about this is if you have a game scene with a lot of things in the background covered by foreground objects Basically, PowerVR and the Dreamcast is aimed to make drawing that much more efficient. And 90% of the time, you will have things covered up in 3D worlds. It's just the way it is. And hopefully you'll get the idea that this is completely different thinking to most 3D graphics at the time. And I can already hear you scratching your heads thinking, but didn't Sega want to make the Dreamcast easier to program? Surely being different is just what caused the Saturn's issues. And you would be right, but they had a few tricks up the sleeve for that one. Well, the first way they learnt the lesson from the Saturn was they had all the libraries to access all these hardware features from day one. They were inbuilt in the Dreamcast documentation, things like that. And you didn't have to know the hardware at such a lower level like you did with the Saturn to get the best out of it. And the other thing as well is the way Power VR worked in the Dreamcast, and again, I'm going to simplify this a lot, um, so please bear with me. You, all the developer had to do was, while they were calculating the 3D worlds, was send lists of polygons that they wanted to draw to memory in lists, grouped together in, in, in certain areas, and then the Power VR algorithm on the hardware itself in the Power VR chip would do all that calculation itself. So basically as a developer, all you needed to do was make sure you put the 3D polygons in the right places, in memory, in the right order, and the Dreamcast would rasterize that for you. Um, rasterization is basically all computers do it. It's the process of turning a polygon or triangle into pixels to be displayed on screen. So the Dreamcast would handle the grunt and the heavy lifting. You as a developer could concentrate on 
your lighting and your, and your effects work and things like that and just let this Dreamcast draw, figure out the best way to draw it in effect. And this also brings me to Windows CE. Again, Windows CE was an operating system by Microsoft designed for various PDAs and things like that at the time. It was meant to be lightweight um, for things that weren't fully fledged PCs. Now Sega entered into a partnership with Microsoft to customize this for the Dreamcast, which would include its DirectX functions. And again, this was a learning from the Saturn that a lot of PC developers could be ported across and unify that development environment. Um, to help port titles across but in reality it wasn't really ever used that much uh, two notable exceptions would be Sega Rally 2 and Resident Evil 2 using it what more Streamcast games did because Sega's libraries were so good that they provided with it for doing that low level hardware access they just have their own OS on the disc which was based on those libraries and you had direct hardware access so it was much much quicker if you think about it um, in the old specy days for example on the 8-bit micros coding in windows ce would be the equivalent of using basic and coding with the dreamcast own libraries would be the equivalent of assembly code it was just much faster and you get more power out of the hardware with that and that's pretty much it for how it worked really um the, the cpu did what it should it kept track of all those triangles and where they should be as it needs to because basically the you know if you're tracking a 3d world you need to know where your objects are colliding with each other so the cpu is keeping track of all them as a developer you just need to know where the camera is you send the triangles that are in the camera view to the system memory and then hollywood draw them out that's pretty much it it was a really nice system that apparently a lot of developers loved um, and it was much simplified obviously developers would have to calculate lighting within those 3d environments and and fog and things like that but it, again the dreamcast had uh, volumetric lighting uh, volumetric fog i think i don't think it had volumetric lighting that's really complicated but it had volumetric fog and things at the hardware level on that gpu to help things out there was some really advanced stuff there and as always, you'll notice I haven't really gone into the audio much here because, again, I'm not an audiophile, so I, I tend to just explain the visuals. But the audio chip, by all accounts, was no slouch. It continued Sega's excellent partnership with Yamaha, who goes way back to the, the, the older Mega Drive days and, and even earlier. And it also had direct access to that GD ROM, which helped with playback. Uh, much like other CD consoles based before it and the relatively big two megabytes of audio memory didn't hurt that either Now after looking under the hood, I've become increasingly Impressed with the Dreamcast Sega really was just completely ahead of its time with this console um, Even if it did cost them in the end I mean the power VR chips had manufacturing problems before launch which meant they couldn't fill all the pre-orders um, and the fact that they partnered up with a firm doing things differently to Nvidia and ATI who would go on to dominate the market. Kind of sums up Sega. They tried to do things smarter and cleverer and were way ahead of the time and were punished for it really in terms of the difficulties they had. But still, next time you look at that little powerhouse sat on your shelf, hopefully you'll be a bit more impressed by it. I know I am and I'm much more appreciated of it. It was a fantastic console that was forward looking but as always at the end of these videos i do like to say please let me know if i've got anything wrong in here this is all based off my own research and my own understanding uh, this isn't a full-time job so i may get things wrong from time to time so please let me know if you've got any corrections i know a few guys out there are you know homebrew developers and things like that and they'll often comment and give me some corrections so it's much appreciated for them i will pin them on the co on the thread as always and just if you've got any thoughts on the dreamcast at all i would love to hear them in the comments and as always if you've enjoyed the video if you could leave a like it would be much appreciated and if you could even consider subscribing again that would be much appreciated i'm retro 48k and i'll see you next time